All right. Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and you are watching Friday Morning Conversations, where we talk and discuss the scriptures and uh, the heart of the Father. And um, we're glad you're joining us. There's my our board member, David Jacobs, and there's Gabriella. Um, and, you know, uh, I my wife is much better with names, so I think I said that right. But we're glad for everybody that's ch chiming in. And um, uh, good to have Pastor Kyle back. How you doing, my brother? I'm doing great. How are you today? I'm doing good. Uh, it is a beautiful 64 degrees here in the <laughs> Ozark. We're kind of at the tail end of Missouri. We're at the right where there's Arkansas, uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri joins. And uh, you can't throw a rock and hit it, but it's not that far away. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, it's it's beautiful. It's nice out. Uh, I've I've got some errands to run this afternoon. Faye and I are going to spend some time together. So uh, it's always good to do that when the weather is nice. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I just want to. I was going to wait till the end of the show to make an announcement, but I'm going to go ahead and make an announcement now. Um, on Tuesdays, coming up this coming Tuesday. For the following three Tuesdays, we always do these shows in series of three. I, I don't know why. It's not a Trinitarian thing. It just happened. <laughs> uh, but uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, we're going to do something that we haven't done with this software before and something we haven't done for a long time with any series of shows, and that is we're going to put together a panel discussion. Pastor Kyle's going to be on. Uh, Apostle Alec Martin is going to be on. Um, and uh, Pastor Michael Porter is going to be on. And so the four of us are going to be on. I will kind of moderate and kind of uh, join in and do some things. But um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Brother Chris uh, Jackson from Branson uh, says I'm looking good today. Hey, I'm feeling good today. So <laughs> that's all that all works together. So we've been so we're going to be doing a panel discussion. We haven't determined the subject yet or the topic, but uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, and this could be a trend, Pastor Kyle. I mean, it's hard for me. I've got a program where I schedule everybody. I've got a list of, you know, what we've done all year and last year and how everything is. But to get three people on at once on a consistent basis would be quite an effort. Um, yeah. And I know you're always down with whatever's going on. And, <laughs> um, you know, there's others that can do that. So we're going to have a lot of fun on Tuesday nights doing uh, a panel discussion starting this coming Tuesday. But today, we've been talking about being one with God and man. This is part three. And um, the, the thing is, is that people really have a struggle with maybe not so much being one with God, okay? Uh, I think people don't see themselves in the same image and likeness as the Father because uh, it's still a religious thing that says it's sacrilegious, it's blasphemy to say you're like God. Uh, you know, I've, I've never said that I'm equal to God. Uh, I've always said that I am the mirrored reflection of God because that's what the Hebrew language says. I know that that uh, the, that being created a little lower than Elohim is um, uh, really uh, can be defined as a hair width difference than God. We, we understand all of that. But the fact is we're one with our father. But now the other side of the coin is when you tell people they are one with man, the first thing we see is all the division. We see all of the uh, the issues about uh, who's who and uh, who does what and our likes and our dislikes. And we never put look past, as the scriptures allude to, to look past the veil of the flesh yeah. and see that we were all created spirit beings thousands of years ago, probably longer, uh, in our father, out of our father. And that makes us one. Even though in this natural realm, we don't act so much. But see, Jesus came in the flesh that he might redeem flesh. So we've been redeemed in the flesh. So we've been set right to that previous state of being one. Some people really have an issue with it. And before we get into any scriptures this morning, Pastor Kyle, just take off on that. What's the problem with people? Why? You know, why can't we all just get along? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think it... it you know, at its core, it really requires what you just mentioned. That's taking a look beyond what we see in the natural. Yeah. You know, look, look, we're we're polar opposites as far as how we look, right? So someone's yeah. looking at this video and they're saying these are two totally different people. How in the world can they ever claim to be one? I mean, they don't even come from the same family. They don't even come from the same 
culture or, you know, whatever. But if I look beyond what I see in you right now, and you look beyond what you see in me right now, we're going to get to something called the spirit. And that's going to be of one kind. That's going to be of one source. So that's really what we should be doing. We should be looking down at the core of people, not on the exterior of people. And it's really the same thing we've done with, as it pertains to our relationship with our father. We have tried to do everything externally instead of doing everything internally. And that's another reason why we're so off in these, oh, that's sacrilegious, oh, that's blasphemous, because again, we're looking externally instead of internally. Right. And that, that's a huge problem when it comes to living this, this supernatural life, is that we keep looking and judging everything based on the external. So uh, we, we, we taught when we were in a faith camp, let, let's just be light and say it that way. When we were in a faith camp, we talked about and we, we really promoted the idea of not being moved by what we see, what right. we hear, what we touch, by the natural elements. That was a really big deal. I don't think it's still uh, something we, we've shoved in the closet uh, as something like you would a past you know, uh, array of trophies or whatever. It, it's not that. We still believe we should not be moved by what we see, touch, and, and so on. But the problem is, is we are. So many people are still moved by our differences, by the, the news, by the political system, by the educational system, by the state systems that make individual decisions. We're moved by so many things and if we could just drop, yeah, I think it's Second Corinthians uh, 5. I'd, I'd have to look it up real quick. Yeah, five. It talks yeah. about, yeah, if we strip away this earthly house, this, this earthly tent, what we would have is a house made by God, not by right. human hands. So right. what house is made by God? Well, guess what? Everything you see in the mirror and everything you don't see in the mirror was made by God. That's, that's number one. Yeah. But the fact is, when you strip away the earthly house, what you're doing in essence is you're saying, if I can look past the veil of the flesh and I can see God in me, what I would see is not just God in me, but I would see God. I would see that likeness and image. And that's really the hang up is being able to look past our differences, look past our, our diversities, because we all have them. We have some, I mean, the way I get up and get dressed is probably different than the way somebody else does. Uh, the way I eat is probably different than somebody else. So what? Okay. Um, it's just, uh, the, it's just one of those things. It's, it's almost at really a human trait that says, you're so different. I just don't like you. And I'll tell you what, Pastor Kyle, I have to keep myself in check about that. Whether I'm watching television or I'm watching people downtown, uh, those differences sometimes can rub you wrong. And you've got to keep yourself in check right. as a child of God, as a creation of God, knowing that they also are the same creation of God. Yeah. You know, I live in a very, <clears throat> would, would be called maybe urban uh, environment here. Uh -huh. And uh, there, there's a there's a wide range of, of diversity. I mean, just so wide range. Um, and in some of the, I guess, harder hit areas of the town where there's probably a little bit more maybe poverty and crime. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in these areas. I, I walked these streets as a little boy going from place to place. So I know them very well. I still drive through a lot of these streets. And sometimes... You know, well, in my past, when I was religious minded, when I saw things through that religious veil, which my goodness, I mean, that thing is hard to see through, right? <laughs> um, I used to see these people and I, I would just see them and would, I'd, I'd have great disgust. I'd see young men standing on the corner with their pants sagging down and I'd, I'd just get utterly disgusted. Just, oh, you just, oh, you know, and, and, and I tell you what, in that moment of that disgust, I'm no good for anyone. I can't help you sure. at all. I, I, I can't minister to you. Even if I try to, even if I felt the urge of the spirit, so to speak, to go up and try to give them an encouraging word, they're going to tell by my presentation, my, by my demeanor, by my attitude that I really don't want to talk to you because you disgust me. So it's really not going to do them any good whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Well, once grace and the truth of God's unconditional love, our Father's great unconditional love for all, really began yes, to get down into my core and begin to speak from my core to me. 
wow, it really changed the way I look at people now when I go through some of those same streets and, and, and parts of our city. I no longer see them in that ray of disgust. I now look at them and the, and the very first thing I think of, if any of those ill thoughts try to come up, I say, mm -hmm. highly beloved of the father. He's highly beloved mm -hmm. of the father. She's highly beloved of the father, just like I am. And I tell you what, that has helped me tremendously not to get into me about what I yeah. see when I look at other people. Yeah, because you're really just reminding yourself as a spirit being of who you need to project as a flesh being. And right. uh, that's and, and all of that, it connects the, the natural and the supernatural in the realm of our soul, the realm of our thinking. So we have to retrain our right. thinking uh, uh, back to its former state. Right now, I have some scripture today um, that we can talk about, and you probably have a, a lot of things to interject here also. But in John 17, I love John 17. Oh, me too. Uh, there's a lot of things. John is a really unique book of the Bible, uh, whether it's Big John or the Three Little Johns, uh, because uh, uh, this is the one that is not one of the synoptic gospels. So there's right. not a lot of the same thing, but just told in a different way mm -hmm. uh, here. But John is the, the, the one who is called John the Beloved. He's the one who constantly had his head laid on the chest of Jesus, symbolically, spiritually indicating that he was always listening to the Father's heart. He was yeah. trying to get an inside. It's kind of like cornering the market in the stock market, kind of getting an inside uh, a tip. He was trying to hear what Father had to say. And here in John 17, verse 15, uh, through 17, he's, Jesus is praying and he says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Now we have to define this, that the evil one of that day, it, yeah. this does not say Satan, this does not right. say devil, this right. does not say a demon. The evil one of that day was the, the, the religious system Thanks. that was constantly hounding these Jews because Jesus is praying for his Jewish disciples. Thank you and for it putting says, that up. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. I love clearing that up. <laughs> yeah, I love that because a lot of people get stuck on people, that one. Yeah. Oh yeah, when you read John ten ten, the thief comes to steal, kill, and right. immediately people transliterate that to say something that it does not say and does right. not mean. You right. you re, you can read Antichrist into the Book of Revelation all day long, but Antichrist is not there, and right. you can't determine that Beast is the Antichrist because Beast is that governmental Roman system that was ruling in that day. So yeah, those things really do need to be cleared up. And he goes on to say, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, or it should read, set them apart by your truth. Your word is truth. And I think the value of this for us today, even though there's going to be more clarity as we go into verse 20, the, the value of this today is that truth is what sanctifies us or sets us apart right. as being like our father. It's not intended, Pastor Kyle, to make us different from everybody else. Right. See, this is this. I, I love being a Christian. My problem with the term Christian is it generally says we are Christians and you are not. Right, right. That, that's like we're of this group and you are not. So it's right. a members only club and you can't get in. That's so not the case. And when I say Christian, that's not what I mean at all, because I believe Christian really indicates being Christ-like or trying to act like Christ, and it's not intended to segregate anyone. But Jesus is praying this prayer here, and he's praying for his disciples and saying, look, you know, they're not of this world. In other words, they were not born of this world, even though they have a natural mom and daddy and they have had a natural birth. They're not really of this world. So there's got to be another mindset. Right. Right. You know, the thing I really I've I've I've, I've always loved John chapter 17. I've come to love it even more when I've listened to some other people expound on it, like yourself and uh, Baxter Kruger and different people. And one thing that I that I found while going back into John chapter 17 is something pretty I think is pretty phenomenal. And here is Jesus making this prayer for mm -hmm. them for humanity, as you, you read a little bit further down, he, he goes mm -hmm. and speaks towards humanity. And here's the kicker. He's making this declaration of our oneness with the Father before the cross. 
Yeah, yeah. Now, to me, that's huge. That that's like a that's where the neons start flashing, and you get a you get a moment that you say, "Well, wait a minute here," because based upon everything we've been taught in our religious circles, suggests that wait a minute, this doesn't happen until you do something, you say something, you confess something, you act out some type of act. Right. Right. Um, but Jesus is showing us something totally differently. He's saying, hey, I'm making a declaration to you that this is who you are. You just mentioned the word sanctify or the, the, what the truth, how the truth brings you into a place of understanding. I really right. believe more than ever, as we now look back at the things Jesus was saying as it pertains to the gospel, he was making declarations not given us conditional provisions of what we needed to do to make the truth real. He was declaring to us what is true about us, right. including our oneness with our father. Right. And I think that's so phenomenal what you just mentioned in that Jesus is praying this prior to the cross. But here's the thing. Many people in, in the religious system today even look at uh, the cross as that's the dividing of all people. If right. you confess Jesus, if you, uh, John 3, 16, uh, whosoever believes or in their heart, uh, they're going to have eternal life. But you have to keep in mind, there's a couple of scriptures I taught in my, uh, um, in my college class, uh, the, the opening session. I taught how that that scripture, John 3, 16, was not for all mankind. It was for the Jews. And here's why. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. The word that there has always detoured us theologically to believe that that was a thing that was lost, such as dominion. But that there actually is a word, a, a, a word that can be translated into saying they that were lost or those who were lost. And it was the Jews who were lost. Jesus came to his own Jews and they received him not. John chapter four tells us as he's speaking to the woman of Samaria, he says that for salvation is of or for the Jews. So, you know, I wasn't under the law. I wasn't under any curse of the law. So I didn't have to be redeemed from the curse. So how did all mankind come together in Christ in this flesh realm and the resurrection? We were all raised up in his resurrection. So from this end to this end of the finished work, there were several things that happened and we just all get to be a part of it. But after the cross, what he's saying here, he's actually setting the stage for the way things actually are. He's right. praying uh, not only to the father, but he's also, the scripture says that Jesus never did say anything or do anything that he didn't hear the father say or do. So he's exactly. speaking the father's heart. Right. And he, he goes on to say in verse 20 and 21, I do not pray for these alone. Right. <laughs> not just my <laughs> disciples, not just those I'm currently talking to right. you about, right. but, but for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that they would, be, would that the world, the world, the world, the whole world may believe that you sent me. So Jesus is making it clear that, Father, my prayer is not just for my disciples. I'm praying for everybody. And I know it says for those who believe. But here again, it was the Jews who really needed to embrace that the Messiah that they rejected, they needed to believe in him. So the reality is, you know, he, he gets very clear here. And look how many times he repeats this issue about being one. This is what I want to see happen, Father. This is what I believe is. So uh, go ahead with that. <laughs> Let me ask a question, and this might kind of get us off on the rabbit trail a little bit. But, um, you know, when you speak about Jesus assignment to a certain group, right? So you don't okay. have to start thinking about, well, why to this certain group? Why at that time? And so here's the question. Do you think that 70 AD could have been prevented? Now, if you ask me that question, I'm going to say absolutely yes. Because if you go back again, you look at some of the things Jesus is saying. He's, he's love your neighbors, you know, who were their neighbors in, in a big sense, 
the Roman, the, the Romans and the, the, the Roman government. What if they would have, again, those that believe on me, right? Mm-hmm. Those who, who, who take my words and, and things like that. He's, he's speaking about this. You'll be saved. You won't be condemned, yada, yada, yada. What if he's trying to get them to understand the value of loving one another through a peaceful love? And the whole revolt that happened in 70 AD could have been avoided. All that bloodshed, all of that murder, all of that chaos could have been averted had they hearkened, listened, believed on the words that he said they would have been saved from that whole thing. Who did it affect? Who did it? I mean, I mean, you know. Yeah. So you, you start thinking about it like that as well in terms of Jesus is coming to them, speaking to them about these things. Believe on me. Listen to my words. You know, we've taken it as in our theological circles, as Jesus is saying, oh, you better believe on me or you're going to burn forever. Well, they had no yeah. concept of that, <laughs> yeah. but they had a, they definitely had a concept of. Hey, we hate these Romans. Hey, we want to drive them out of Jerusalem. Hey, we don't want any part of this. Hey, we're going to revolt. They had a concept about that. And I believe Jesus in in part to them was saying, hey, listen, if you follow these words that I'm going to tell you, if you follow peace, if you follow the the way of love, if you listen, if you believe on what I'm telling you, this whole thing will be avoided. Yeah. And I I would not even uh, begin to disagree with that. I would say this, that you you would have to backtrack to every system all the way to Adam, that if Adam hadn't have have sinned. Um, The question was asked to me, why did God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? And my simple and and, um, um, just just common sense answer is, is because we are never, God never intended for us to be a bunch of puppets on a string. God intended for us to have to display our individuality in the light of our oneness with him and with each other. And so man had to have a choice. That's free will. He had to have a choice. And God let man make his own decisions. It's like our children at different stages in their lives. We give them certain authorities or or decision making rights so that it helps them to grow up and mature. And I don't think our I don't think we learn that just because we're good good at being human beings. I think we learned that out of the nature of our father that's already been imparted in us. So yeah, uh, if people would have uh, not rejected Jesus as Messiah, um, as a matter of fact, let's go all the way back to the Tower of Babel uh, and other instances where if man wouldn't have rebelled against God and would have just embraced uh, the, the God Jehovah, the one they knew at that time, then yeah, things would certainly have been different. But as we know, as time went on and man continued to rebel and build his own religious systems, trying trying to recreate God, and and let's let's face it, sometimes really believing in God, but just couldn't see him or understand him because of the veil of the flesh. So now let's recreate God in our own image. We still believe in God, but we don't like the image that somebody else is portraying to us. So let's create him in our own image. And uh, yeah, I, I think that you're right there. 80, 70 could have been averted. Um, but that religious system all the way from the Tower of Babel right. to AD 70 had to come down, had to come to an end. And, you know, the book of Revelation, Pastor Kyle, um, I think it's in chapter three, one of the seven churches where he talks about that. Uh, the, it, it takes revelation and teaching. Can't, I can't just say it and give you the answer uh, because right. I'm, in, I'm in chapter 14 and I'm at less than 100 and 114 or 115. Um, and, and so it takes some explaining. But the fact is, is that, that God is bringing that system down in our own thinking. Right. Everything in us that rebels against God, because it's going to be God's way. Okay. He is right. He is just, he is holy. And he's bringing us into uh, a, a mindset of us realizing that we're just like our father. Yeah. But um, yeah. Uh, and this is what I believe where we're at right now is in a state of a continuation of change in our thinking. And, right. you know, thinking is becoming so much more pure. Oh, Life yeah. is becoming easier to live. Yeah. Y- have you yeah. noticed that we, oh, yeah. from when, when we used to struggle, 
trying to make it happen and believing hard and all these declarations, nothing wrong with declarations, nothing wrong with believing, nothing wrong with trusting God. But man, to do it from stress compared to doing it from rest, life is so much better, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I was going to get my coffee this morning. I have a morning routine. I get up and walk up, you know, three blocks or so to get my coffee at the local Dunkin' Donuts. And, um, on the way back, I had a flashback moment. I've taken this walk hundreds of days over the past, you know, six or seven years. So you're talking every day, twice a week, yeah. you know, twice a day. I mean, you, you know, you're in you're in the thousands at this point of taking this walk. Uh, when I first moved here, where I am now, in those very, you know, first few years, five or six years or so, I was still in my morning declaration phase where I got up every morning, I spoke my 15 minutes of declarations and which I believed at the time was going to be how I was going to get breakthrough. So I'm walking back this morning and that memory flashes by my head and I'm kind of like, yeah, that was, that was, you know, kind of laughing at myself. But this is the, this is the portion of the, that daily confession that came back to me. And it was Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed me from poverty. Christ has redeemed me from sickness. Christ has redeemed me from spiritual death. Now, um, when I used to say it before, I, I was only saying it because I thought that Jesus was going to eventually come down, rescue me out of these things, and then I'd be okay. So I kept saying it, waiting for Jesus to come save me out of sickness, poverty, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> Well, when yeah. I when I when I had that flashback this morning, it hit me. It occurred to me, <coughs> the Christ is the Christ in me. <laughs> yeah. The Christ in me has redeemed me from poverty. The Christ in me has redeemed me from sickness. The Christ in me has redeemed me from these things, or saved me, or rescued me, or gi given me the way out of these things, the power, the ability, yeah. the thinking out of these things so I don't have to experience it. So in my confession days, I was saying it, looking for the, the Jesus to come instead of recognizing the Christ in me, the hope of glory that was there to say, hey, 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 son, hey, Kyle, yeah. pay attention. Let me help you think your way out of this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Only I brought that up because you were talking about thinking, how our thinking is changing. And it's primarily because we're identifying with the Christ in us and starting yeah. to think through the mind of Christ, which, hey, you know, I've come to a place now I understand, hey, I'm one with health. I'm one with wealth. I'm one yeah. with all happiness. I'm one with joy. I'm one with peace. <laughs> so when you when you see it and understand it, you start realizing right away that there's no separation, of course. There's no issue, yeah. of course, really, right? So everything we're we're experiencing that we call issue, it has to be in our sensory experience. It can't be in our true core experience because it doesn't exist there. So we get exactly. out of what we see and get into what we know. I tell you what, we're talking about some real life changing stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've been redeemed from the law of sin and the law of death. The law of sin said, if you break the law by sinning, then you're going to experience the punishment, which is the curse of the law. The law of death is that if you live your life any way you want to, uh, guess what? Uh, you're going to grow old and you're going to grow old quick and your body's going to deteriorate and you are going to die. Of course, death was taught differently than we teach death. But let's just face it. If I've been redeemed now, uh, when I take the checkbook and I balance the checkbook, that's kind of the generic term. The legal term or the proper term uh, is to reconcile the checkbook. OK, so I take all of the deposits and all of the expenditures and I balance them out and I reconcile it. Think about it. The word reconcile actually means to set right again or to to make it as it always was. In other words, it's correct. It's accurate. And when we think about that, we think about what Father God did in Christ for this flesh realm that went on for thousands of years. He reconciled us back to the father in our thinking. Now, it doesn't mean we weren't always with the father, right. but to do that, he had to reconcile us 
from the law of sin and death. I like the idea of being, you know, sin's not an issue. Even if I blow it, I'm not, I'm not, you know, considering that and not getting hung up by that. But what, what I'm saying is, is even being reconciled from death. Think about that. If I'm reconciled from death, you know, a lot of people, a lot of Christians believe, and I'll say Christians this time uh, intentionally uh, to the group that believes in death. We got to live and we got to die. Those are the only two things I got to do. <laughs> I got to live and I got to die. Guess what? Uh, you don't have to die. Although I've never met someone yet, Pastor Kyle, who's living this uh, sons of God life. But I want to tell you, uh, I believe that I'm seeing people get older and still be stronger. I'm hearing about it more and more and more, and things have changed. So we've been redeemed. We've been reconciled. And yeah, Father God, really, uh, you know, I think about this more and more. I think about the remote tribes of the world when I was a small boy mm -hmm. who actually worshipped the great spirit in the sky or a higher power, or something greater than themselves, and they did it in the only ways they knew how, but they were reaching out. Something in them was crying out. Now, that something it has an identity, and that's Father God, who is always a part. You know, we love John 1, verse four, uh, 3 and 4, that tells us that, that Jesus is the life that is the light of men. In other words, man cannot have being unless God is being in them, God in them. So uh, that's what I love about Jesus came, Emmanuel, God with us, God in us. You can't survive. You can't, you can't be, they say you can't be alive without blood in your body. I got news for everybody. You can't be alive in this realm without God in you. It's God. Yeah. That's the generator. That's the life force that causes us to live. Yeah. And see, once again, You've mentioned some things Jesus said. You mentioned some things that John revealed. They're declarations. They're, they're mm -hmm. not conditional uh, instructions or something. They're declarations. This is yeah. what it is. This yeah. is who you are. It's yeah. God in you. It's not you crying out for. You know, I think one of, the, one of the phrases that kind of hurt us a lot over the years is cry out to God. You know, well, I know what we're trying to say. But, I mean, what are we really saying? You know, we're really yeah. saying that God is out there somewhere and we need to make our cry out to him. Lift up your, your, your eyes into the hills and cry out to God and, you know, oh, Lord, where are you? You know, there's another phrase we had in our church. You know, you got to trust him when you can't trace him, you know. Uh, you can't, <laughs> you don't know where he's at, but you just got to trust him. He's somewhere <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. And all of these things just pushed us further away from the declarations that was spoken by Jesus or revealed by John or, or some of the other writers. They were making declarations. And I tell you what, when, we're, when we stop reading scriptures from a conditional uh, perspective and all that we've got to do to become and start receiving these as declarations, I mean, that's instant transformation in your thinking. You know, you mentioned yeah. earlier about coming into the place of rest, coming to a place of peace. The moment you realize, you know, that the work is finished, what do you do? You know, when you're working on a, a natural job and the whistle goes off or your time shift comes or whatever it is, what do you do? You pack yeah. up and you go home, yeah. you know? You, you know, unless you're going to work overtime or something, and you know, there's a monetary gain for that. But in a natural sense, when your shift is over, you go home. If your boss, your employer or whoever came to you and said, hey, Bill, guess what? We're going to pay you for the remaining time you would have worked for our company. Don't ever come back. We're still going to pay you. What are you going to do? You're never going to yeah. come back. You're going to shake his hand. You might give him a hug. Hey, you might give him a kiss on the cheek. Who knows? But the, you know, the bottom line is you're not going to go back to that place of work. Once that declaration has been made that your work is done and it's been yeah. your, your, your time has been paid for, once that declaration has been made, you're no longer working to make that money. And when we start seeing scriptures as declarations, again, and not as conditional provisions for us, it really, really changes the whole ballgame. Amen. Amen. And one of the things that would benefit us 
uh, in life, to live life, is to understand our oneness with God and with man. It's not making peace. It's just flowing in the peace that exists. Right. Uh, last night on my show, um, we talked about finding the unforced rhythm of grace. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, that that is a, a teaching. Uh, I know that Pastor Mark Wallace does and that, that we investigated that. It, it's about that you've got to f- understand that place from a scriptural perspective. And when you do, you understand that grace is not a forced rhythm. It's getting in the rhythm that already exists and you flow in it. Next mm-hmm. Thursday night, Dr. Roy uh, Richmond's going to be on my show. We're going to be talking cool. about something like living as Holy Spirit and the unforced rhythm of life. So a, a similar topic to some degree, but I've been listening to some of his teachings about that and it's phenomenal. And yeah. so so living life, uh, realizing that I can come from one perspective, like you were talking, go through all my 15 minutes of confessions and, and uh, for me and about me and then 15 minutes of prayer for somebody else. And, and I remember that I used to go to my office every morning many years ago and I had lists and lists and lists of names and prayer requests and two, two and a half hours, I would be praying. That was my start of the morning when I'd go to the office, go through all of this. And I'm not saying it's bad. It's where I was at the time. It's what I knew to do. It's what I was taught to do. But somehow we thought if we did all of that, then everything would be hinged on everything that we did. It would be a work thing. It's like forcing this thing about grace and about God. I mean, if you and I can't know that God's got not only our back, but my neighbor's back, and his neighbor's back, and the neighbor beyond that's back, and uh, the neighbor on the other side of the world. If God's not God, we would be absolutely in trouble. But the fact is, our Father is the ruler of the entire universe, not just of our lives. He's His DNA is in all things. And so living life unforced, without trying to make it happen, is it is is where we need to be but you know what pastor kyle it cannot be uh that it's all about what i do now it doesn't delete that you know i make declarations when i teach the book of revelation i see sons of god making declarations over their own nation the nations of their own life and the nations of the world that's our responsibility as a a remnant company uh, the the book of Revelation calls it a first fruits company or a messenger company. Uh, but the fact is, we declare. But just like you said about what Jesus was praying, Jesus wasn't saying, Father, I hope these things come to pass. Right. I'm praying, believing it some way, somehow, before I go to the cross, you're actually going to do this for me. No, he was just speaking the Father's heart. He was declaring what is. He was prophesying the words of the father that already are. And, you know, Pastor Kyle, I don't want to miss anything, but we, he goes on to John 17 verse Mm -hmm. 24 in the passion translation. And he says, father, I ask that you allow everyone that you have given to me to be with me where I am. Then they will see my full glory, the splendor you have placed upon me because you have loved me even before the beginning of time. So if Jesus was praying prior to the cross that he wants me and you and all those around to be with him where he is, where is he? Um, you know, that's like the hide and seek, but I'm just telling you where I am. So it's really not hide and seek. He, he's in the realm of the spirit. He always existed there with everybody else. Now he comes into this natural realm and he's saying, you know what, Father, I just want, I just want the very splendor the very essence of who you are that you've placed in me in this this physical realm uh, that that people become awakened to that because the message is you love me and I love them and really they don't know it yet but they love one another and this has gone on since before the beginning of time even Jesus spoke about before time began yeah another awesome declaration yeah here's another declaration right another yeah declaration of truth coming into the ears of people who had for since the time of Moses specifically had brought to their understanding a huge gulf between them and the father a huge yeah. gulf between who they were and who the father knew they were 
And from that moment on, you know, Moses was on the top of the mountain, you know, getting the laws or whatever. And from that yeah. moment on, they felt and believed that they had to climb a mountain to get to God. This mountain yeah. became known as the law. This mountain became known as performance. This mountain became known as works. And Lord knows, they just never really ever got to the top of that mountain. Right. Jesus comes down off of the mountain, begins to um, deal with, in a sense, or to live amongst those who thought that God was in a far off place. And he reveals to them, hey, you don't have a you don't have to climb a mountain to get to know the father. Hey, yeah, he's with you right here. He's, you know, for for better way to say it. He's kind of come off of the mountain of your understanding, and he's right here with you. Come on now. Emmanuel, God with us, he's right here with you. And so that was, again, more that de declaration, Jesus declaring a truth. Now, we really missed this, right, for, for years. I mean, we've, we've missed this all along, for so long. And, you know, I, re I remember when... when um, Ephesians chapter one really grabbed me where Paul picks up this theme of Jesus about before the foundation. And right. when he talks about it, I mean, you know, it, it captures you one day and you go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> if this has always been and it has, you know, why did it take me so long to get here? Well, again, because we thought that there was this gulf between us and God and and my goodness, the, the law, the lie of separation probably has done more damage to us as hum, as humanity than probably any other lie right. that we've ever believed. This lie that we've right. been separated because we've been working so hard and so diligently trying to get up that mountain back to God when all the while he's always been with us. So, hey, we've put down our hiking gear, man. We've taken off our hiking book, book, boots and <laughs> we, we dropped all that stuff. We've jumped yeah. into a hammock with him. You know, we're sitting by the cool of the bay in the cool of the day, just relaxing with him like it should have always Come been. Come on. Come on. You know, the Lord just uh, uh, spoke to me of a picture of a natural mountain as you were talking about our natural mind, the elevation of our thinking in the natural and a natural mountain uh, at certain elevations, the oxygen begins to get thinner. And when the oxygen gets thinner, a, a man becomes a little more lightheaded, especially if you're not used to that. Well, we're not used to this elevated place of thinking on our own mountain of carnality. Uh, and we are lightheaded. We are not thinking straight. We're not getting it. So we got to come down, as you said, come down from the mountain. And, and really what, you know, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, I'm leaving my mountain but I'm going to live in the mountain of the Lord and the mountain of the Lord. He is that mountain. So it's not like you got to climb another mountain It just jump in and enjoy him. Um, yeah. And this is so powerful. What Jesus is saying, he goes on in verse 25 and I've got a few of them, but he, he says, you are my righteous father. That's a no brainer. Okay. Uh, he is our righteous father. But the unbelieving world has never known you in the perfect way. Now, it doesn't say they've never known him. It says they've never known him in the perfect way that I know you. And all those who believe in me, the Greek says these disciples also know that you have sent me. This story reminds me, or this scripture reminds me of Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night and says, um, we know we, who's we? The, the, I think it was the 60 members of the Sanhedrin Council, of which he was at the, uh, one of the top men. He was also a, had a traveling ministry, and he comes by night. Why? Well, he's a Jew, being with another Jew. Why come to Jesus by night? Why not, why not come to him in broad daylight? Because he didn't want to be accused of siding in or hanging out with this guy that so many of them accused Jesus of hanging out with other people. And, and he says, we know that you are sent from God because you couldn't do the things you do if you weren't. Okay, we're not going to stop the crucifixion, but we know you've been sent by God. We're not going to stop the badgering and the beatings and the, the ridicule of the Pharisees, but, but we know you've been sent by God. And so Jesus is saying, you know what? Uh, the, the, the unbelieving world, 
why are they unbelieving? Because they haven't become acquainted with Jesus or they would be a believing world. They've never known you in the perfect way that I know you. Um, and, and he says, you know what? They also know that you have sent me. I think that all of humankind, even if, even if you can't get everybody to admit it right now, have an inkling within them that God is God, that there is someone greater than themselves. It's right. not like, did I come from yeah. outer space and from some Martian or alien planet? It's not that. It really is, is that I know there has to be someone that created and put this whole thing together. Otherwise, I couldn't exist. But that's yeah. so amazing that the unbelieving world has never known you in the perfect way that I've known you. You're my righteous father. Yeah. Yeah. God is righteous. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> and remember that, that term righteous. Oh That's yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, John uh, 17 there, you get to the end, you get to verse 26. And then Jesus says oh, yeah. something even more profound that, you know, or just as profound rather. He says, yeah. father, I've made you known and I will make you known, or I've declared you and I will declare you. This tells me, that Jesus has taken personal responsibility for all of humanity to know yeah. what he knows. And when we, when we lose the, the idea that God is restricted by time, or in this case, Jesus is restricted by time, yeah. you know, to get someone to know what he knows. When we lose that idea, man, it really, you know, changes how we see a lot of things. Now, it is advantageous. It is beneficial. I mean, it, some would even say it's, it's mighty crucial for all of humanity to see it sooner than later. And I'm not talking because there's some wrathful God at the end of the podium ready to strike you down when you get there. I'm saying it because it's just going to help you live a more wonderful experience here in this part of the journey. It's beneficial yeah. that way. It's advantageous for us that way. It's crucial for us that way. What did Jesus want us to know? He wanted us to know not only who our father really is, but also of the wonderful ability that we have within us. You know, Jesus begins to reach people by not doing something for them, but really revealing to them what's inside of them. He says to the yeah. woman yeah. at the well, because, you know, as, as, they're, as they're having this conversation, he says to her, if you only knew the gift that is already inside of you, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, and, and then he, he begins to reveal to her why it's important for you to know this gift, because you're, you've been unhappy in relationships all of your lives, all of your life, and you're going to continue down this path until you realize the gift that's inside of you. Now, this for her was crucial and is, it, it's important for her because she's finally going to know how to love herself and be in a real loving relationship rather than keep right. bouncing and bouncing around. I mean, who knows what happened in those five marriages? Who knows? Was she being abused, right. perhaps? Was she being taken advantage? Of? I mean, all kind of things are possible in those five. So Jesus says, hey, there's a gift inside of you, the gift of peace, the gift of love, the gift of joy, happiness. I mean, there's a gift inside of you. And if you know this yeah. gift, which you will, she, she's later going to realize when you know this gift, it's going to change your life. So it's advantageous yeah. for us to get let Jesus make known to us what we need to know. It's, it's, it's beneficial yeah. for us. It's life changing for us. It's crucial for us here. But you know, by chance, you know, someone doesn't quite get it before they close their eyes here. Man, dad's got plenty of time. <laughs> it's, yeah. He's got plenty of time. He's not going yeah. anywhere. <laughs> it's like I said, when my dad uh, died, uh, and, and and I love how you said that, closed his eyes in this realm. Um, the moment he opened his eyes or became 100% aware in the other realm, he said, oh man, I could have stayed. He realized that he didn't have to die, that he could have lived. And my dad wasn't really that old, but uh, I love how Jesus puts this. I don't know what translation you were quoting from, but the Passion Translation says, I have revealed to them who you are. 
Now, this could be could read, I have revealed your name to them, which is similar to the New King James. And he says, and I will continue to make you even more real to them. Now, of course, Jesus is talking at that time to his disciples, but we already seen in his prayer, we're talking to everybody. Mm -hmm. And so how does Jesus, our big brother, continue to make our father more real to us? Remember one of the reasons the Apostle Paul, and I haven't talked about this with anybody, uh, and we may do a future panel discussion about this, about Paul's thorn situation, but... You know, the thing that he was under oppression about was the, uh, you know, think about it. Here's a Jew who works for the Roman government persecuting Christians, and then he becomes a Christian, so to speak. And now he's working for Jesus, switch sides. Not only is he against the Jews who was against Jesus, but the Roman government who was against Jesus. And now, Paul, what the reason he was harassed so badly, the scripture is very clear, is because of the abundance of revelations that the guy received. And he he had been had had what people call out of body experiences. They're really not out of body, but I get the expression. Uh, he had had so many revelations and experiences, encounters from the Lord. Uh, that I relate to him. I identify with him. But think about it. The abundance of revelations. Who wrote the majority of the New, Te uh, the, uh, New Covenant? Paul did. Now, he didn't write the most words, but he wrote the most chapters or most books. But here's the thing. We're getting these abundant revelations that God is giving us. Why? Well, Jesus says, you know what, Father? I'm going to continue to make you even more real to them. And he says, so that they may experience the same endless love that you have for me. For your love will now, will now live in them, even as I live in them. How powerful is that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, Jesus said in another moment, when talking about his departure, so to speak, he says, listen, it's beneficial that I go away. You, you, don't, you don't even understand it. I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah. I got to go away. I, I got to go. It's, it's, it's yeah. to your benefit that I go away. Why? Well, you're going to continue to cling to me instead of learning how to live from within your truth. I'm here right. as your older brother to show you who you are, what you're capable of. Right. But if I stay amongst you, you're just going to cling on to me forever. And then, you know, it, and, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but in some ways we've made Jesus the person into an idol that he was never <laughs> desiring to be. And yeah. we've taken the Christ in us and subjugated the Christ in us to a subordinate level way down the pole somewhere. And, you know, by doing such, Again, we, we're, we're neglecting the gift inside of us. And this is really yeah. crucial. It's really, really important because as you mentioned, Paul, he says the, the Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, we're seated together with Christ. When you, when you start right. to, to kind of separate in a sense, you know, or even as Peter said it, Peter said, thou art the Christ. He was revealing something about Jesus's ability, what Jesus was displaying to them in that aspect. So it's really, really remarkable when you really start to understand, you know, again, the, the revelation, the declaration that was being made about us. And I mean, who else would have been a better revealer, as you just read in the Passion? Who else would have been a better revealer? But the one who knew the father, yeah, the one who exactly. knew what we were capable of and are capable of. And he, out of great love, says, hey, dad, I'll go show him. But but son, yeah. you know, they're not going to accept you. Don't worry about it. I'll go show him anyway. <laughs> you know, they're not going to like you too much, son. Listen, I, I, I can't live with the idea that they don't know. I, I realized that you know, they're going to lose sight of this truth. I mean, they're going to build mountains and they're going to try to get to you in all various different kind of ways. But you right. know what? I love my brothers and sisters and I'm going to go down there and show them. And I tell you what, humanity, humanity is just this bundle of possibility. And we're just, thank, thank God, we're just really learning exactly who we are 
took us some time to get here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we're really, really learning. I, I read an article yesterday of a lady who's 71 years old. And she said she has never experienced any kind of pain one day of her life. Even in childbirth, she's experienced no pain. Now, I love mm. stories like that. I absolutely love it. Because, listen, I love when someone shows me what's possible. Now, you might have a, a thought about something in the back of your head. But when you get a chance to talk to someone or read about someone who's actually lived out something you really believe is possible, man, that gives all of us so much hope. At least it does for me. It really like says, yeah. okay, I knew this thing was possible. Now let's, let's, let's keep discovering here exactly how to make this work. We talked earlier, just briefly, I mentioned John 1, 4, that says that the life of Jesus was the light of men. The word men there is the Greek word anthropos. And it's referring to to a human being, whether male or female. Uh, when you, you know, I hear how that we should, and I hear people say this, we should not use, um, we should not use the, uh, you know, so much theological, theological explanation in Greek and Hebrew and things like that. I have a hard time with that. I, I want to be easy with people and try to help be, bring people along as softly as possible. But I'll tell you, some of the best awakenings I've had were rude awakenings, were instant awakenings, were, were, were mind-shattering, mind-shaking awakenings, and they propelled me into a new dimension. And, uh, I, you know, I just have to believe that I'm nobody any more special than anyone else and that if that works for me, it can work for anybody. But when we, when we understand that God was in men or mankind, um, in humanity. The, the Mirror Bible says, uh, I have made the essence of your being known to them so that they may know you by name. What he's saying here in John 17, 26 in the Mirror Bible is that, you know, I want you to know Father God so well that you're on a first name basis. Now, Father is the best name I know for him, Father, Papa, Daddy, and, and he wants you to be intimately uh, comfortable interacting with the, the God of the universe. You know, most people would just worship him like he's so far away. Right. Uh, like uh, we set up this shrine and we're going to we, we come in connection with this shrine and we're going to <laughs> worship this shrine, believing that we're just not good enough to be on a first name basis with God. Yeah, Yet Jesus is saying, look, I want you to be on a first name basis with my daddy. I right. want you to know him just like right. I know him. Exactly. And Pastor Kyle, that is the greatest form of oneness and yeah. unity that we could ever experience. And then to translate that or transfer that to our relationships to one another. Yep. And that's really where we're, where we're aiming towards. Knowing how we've always been known by him. And not just me, though, but you and the person right. down the street and, and everyone I look at. You're known the same way I'm known. You're seen the same way I'm seen. Now, you may not know it. You may not have come to an awareness of it yet, but hey, right. if I can display to you a, 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 a certain level of love, perhaps you may inquire of me, how do you do that? Why are you so nice or something, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. And now this gives me an opportunity. And... I can say, well, you know what? Truth is, you're just as nice as I am. Oh, no, I, I can never be that nice. I, or, or why are you such a giver? Well, truth is, you're, you're just as good as a giver as I am. Oh, no, I, 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 yeah. I'm stingy. No, 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 not really. It's not really who you are. <clears throat> and you yeah. begin to walk people down this pathway and lead them to the truth of who they really are. I tell you what, when we get out of this behavior modification and performance driven mindset yeah. that we've lived with for so long as it relates to some outward experiences of people and we point them to the truth that's within them, you know, again, this is where transformation comes from. It doesn't come from what I stopped doing on the outside because I, that's a failed policy. 
Yeah. I don't I don't want to stop. And then let me I told God one time about a certain thing I was dealing with. Hey, God, truth is, I don't want to stop. I don't know what you're going to do with that, but I don't want to stop. <laughs> you know, no, that's the truth. I, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm, I don't want to stop. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But that was, again, trying to change it exteriorly to my inside. I remember the day I was in great condemnation over something. And I just it was one of those days where I would just, you know, and I thought it was God at the time. I thought he was really beating me up because I hadn't got this thing right yet. And um, I turned on the radio and I, I would hardly ever listen to Christian radio at the time. But this morning, you know, I, I just, you know, got urged to turn it on. So I'm on my way to work and I turned it on. And, you know, the, the, the speaker is mentioning John 316. And I heard these words. And these words, when this is back in the early 90s, and I heard these words and it said, I would have saved you even though I know that you still wasn't going to get it together, you know, right. or I saved you knowing you still wouldn't get it together. And, and, and my, at, you know, at the time in my understanding, my, my, my eyes welled up with tears and I said, Oh, well, well, wow. You mean to tell me like you still decided to save me, even though you knew that I was just going to keep messing up here. I mean, that was probably the first time I had any clue of, his love, even though I couldn't understand it or define it at that time. But, you, you know, once you move away from, again, this performance thing and drive people to the truth of our father's great love for them and the wonderful oh, grace yeah. he has for all. When you drive people to that truth, these other things have a way of falling off on their own. I revealed yeah. to you who you are, how loved you are, how good you are, how you're known that. Our father, he's not mad at you. He's not angry with you. He doesn't have a vendetta against you. He's not malicious <laughs> against you. you know? yeah. He's not manipulating yeah. things against you so that you would wake up and realize. When you remove all of that stuff, bring people inward to the love that's inside of them and cause them to be aware of what they're unaware of. Again, we're back at the same thing we've been saying. It's life changing. Absolutely. And, and I think that the turmoil that many people are in, uh, they could release that and just live a, a more productive life if they just understood that Father loves them unconditionally, that he's not holding their sins and trespasses against them, that they have been grafted into Jesus, the vine. Um, that, and, and, you know, there's a scripture, Pastor Kyle, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, uh, just from the New King James, says, for as in Adam all die. There's a comma right there, which I know that the printers had to put in there, uh, translators, and said, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Now, this, even though this is post-cross, it still sounds like it's what God's going to do. Right. So I, I went to the literal, uh, the concordant literal version, which is what I use to, in my interlinear studies, to determine what scriptures, what parts of scriptures, what words were in the original, what were not, and how they're translated out of the Greek into the, the broken English language. And the, the English new, uh, the, the Greek to English New Testament word for uh, vivified, because the, 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 the accordion literal version says, even as, for even as in Adam, all are dying, thus also in Christ, all uh, shall all be vivified. I had a problem with that word, but it's a real word. It's a real word. And what, what this is saying, vivified would read, they shall be being made alive. It's not a future tense per se. It's that in this union with Christ, life continues to evolve, continues right. to come. And I think it's so important that we understand that who we are right now, it may be who we've always been, but this is not the end. What I mean is our understanding. We're still like a horse with the blinders on that we can see so much. And although it's becoming wider and more clear uh, until we get up one morning and we have this resurrected body, just like Jesus, when he was resurrected, there's still a transformation happening until right. death is 
absolutely not in the corner of your mind, but nowhere in your mind. Uh, while right. poverty and, and sickness and, and pain is not just in the corner of your mind, but nowhere in your mind that right. you are completely like him. Although that is a true statement, we are, but still we're in this process of being changed in our thinking because our thinking uh, is kind of like, I think my wife taught this when we were doing a show together uh, some time back about the, the ladder or the connect the portal that connects both heaven and earth. And I've heard other people teach people teach on this, that portal or that, that gateway, that passageway, like, like uh, um, uh, apostle uh, John uh, Barrett uh, talking about uh, 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 Jacob's ladder, uh, that, portal that that ladder representing a dna strand okay connecting heaven and earth all right what is it what's happening my thinking is causing heaven to manifest in my earth mm. heaven generally represents the higher realm of thought right earth represents the lower realm of thought so what's happening my lower realm of thought is becoming a higher realm of thought that brings heaven and earth together so that only God is revealed. Only God is manifested in my life. And that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's back to seen versus unseen. It's back to our, our sensory experience versus the mind of Christ. And, you know, so much of what we've been programmed to do is again, as we mentioned earlier, live externally. So, yes. you know, if, if I if I feel a pain, you know, uh, what I've noticed in myself over the past few years, um, you know, I'll see a commercial about cancer or diabetes uh -huh. or something. And, and I'll, I'll get a sense of nervousness right now. I never I never 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 felt this before. Never, never even considered it before. But I, I get a sense of, ooh, you know, that thought comes. Ooh, what if what if one day. Right. So I, I, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if that's really kind of, in a lot of cases, how these things kind of creep in unaware on people. You know, yeah. you, you're yeah. watching on TV, hear a commercial about it, or someone's telling you about it, and you start wondering, well, I wonder if, or maybe I might, or, ooh, you know, and, and that, that thing festers and grows. And what you've done is you've taken something from the earthly realm and you've brought it into, and it just allowed itself to grow. Well, what if we didn't do that and took it just from the heavenly realm or the mind of Christ and just let that grow and fester? Hey, look, yes. that's never going to happen to me. Hey, I'm never going to have that. Hey, I'm going to live a long, happy, successful life. You know, I was driving the other night and, and you know, the lights were really messing with my eyes, something terrible. And I, yeah. you know, I, I thought about it for a minute. I said, no, 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 no. My, my, the cells in my eyes are regenerating every day. They're getting Absolutely. stronger every day. I, I'm not going to accept any other thought outside of my body is always regenerating. I'm always making new cells. I'm making new eye cells or whatever cells I need necessary to not have this blurriness when, when bright lights hit me. My body is regenerating. My eyes are regenerating. I'm not going to buy into an earthly way of thinking that, oh, right. no, your eyesight has to get worse. No, I'm not. I'm not buying that. I'm not that. I'm not buying that. We're not buying cancer. Right. We're not buying diabetes. Right. We're not buying any of those earthly thoughts. I'm going to camp out in the mind of Christ about this. And I'm determined that we're going to get this thing done. You know, we didn't get it done. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I agree with you. Uh, the, the worst thing, I, Faye knows this. I'm, I'm, it's really a bad habit. I will, when a commercial comes on, I turn the channel. Okay. Now, sometimes I don't get back in time to continue the show right immediately. But I'll change it. I don't want to see those commercials. Uh, let me just say this, and I'll say this in front of everybody. I'm not, I'm not uh, anything to be ashamed of. But there was a time in my life some years back that I had to have an operation. And uh, they put a green filled filter in. Uh, in my main artery. Now, what that filter is, so I had massive blood clots in both of my legs. That filter, the design of that filter was intended to save my life at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, blood clots, if you have massive blood clots, they can break loose, go up into your arteries. They say, and I'm careful about that, they say it can go to your heart or lungs and kill you. So they put a green fil filter in. Now, about two years later, they designed one that can be removed. So here's what I believe. Okay, all the blood clots are, are recanalized. It's all, all cool. So I'm believing 
and I, and I, want, I want to tell the story real carefully. I'm believing that that Greenfield filter is dissolving supernaturally. Mm -hmm. Now, here's why. TV comes on and they say, if you have an I, IVP filter, uh, they're dangerous, that the barbs can break off, they can cause you problems and et cetera. This, uh, I hate those commercials. But you know what I do? Turn the channel. Got to thank yeah. God for, I remember the days we had to get up and turn the knob. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank God for the remote. And yeah. I turned the channel. Now, yeah. here's the thing. I am not spending m days or moments or even split seconds right. focusing on, got to get rid of this filter. I just believe the thing is supernaturally dissolving. And when you take an x-ray, it looks like a little umbrella without any a curtain on it it just i believe it's dissolving it, it could already be gone and i told Faye there will be an x-ray yeah. where they will not find that uh yeah. i i just i just think that we we focus so much on what could be right that right. sometimes we think about well if it's happening to someone that took this medicine or had this experience or had a knot or then then we think that oh man that could be me next I had one guest that said that their dad, the dad was just struggled of uh, cancer for several years and they were always in fear that they would get cancer. You know, my mom has ha had cancer before she died. My dad died of cancer. My grandmother had cancer. I got my grandpa had cancer. I had people in my family's had cancer. And, and here's what I say. What does that have to do with me? Right. Nothing. Right. Absolutely nothing. No fear. We yeah. have been redeemed from the law of sin and death and everything that pertains to it. So, Pastor Kyle, it all comes down to, do I really understand my oneness with the Father? Right. Do I understand that as he is, so am I in this right. world. Jesus didn't take a day off of ministry three and a half years, not one day off because he was sick and in the hospital with cancer. Right. <laughs> exactly. I don't read that anywhere. Okay. Exactly. So, uh, bring us a closing word today. This, this has been so good, so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we started talking towards the end here, and it most certainly fits within uh, the, the context of the, the show today about our oneness as it pertains to health as well. Now, I don't have all the answers. You know, I, I don't. But one thing I do know is that I'm one with perfect health. That I know. I don't have oh, all yeah. the answers. You know, I, you know, I'm one with perfect strength. Again, I don't have all the answers. You know, the, depending upon the day that I had, because, you know, sometimes when I do home improvement work, I, I come home and I'm sore all over and, you know, I've been carrying sheetrock and two by fours or whatever. And I'm sore all over and I'm like, oh, boy, boy, I tell you what, it was a day I didn't feel this way. And I no, 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 no. OK, OK, OK. Well, there's a day coming where you won't feel this way again. You're one with perfect strength. Now, again, I don't know how it all works. You know, I know what we have. Uh, in front of us, the historical evidence in front of us that you don't get stronger, you get weaker. I understand all that, historically speaking, but that does not mean that that's the truth. We can buy it if we want to. We can prescribe to it if we want to. We can eat that medicine if we want to, as far as that way of thinking. Or we can take a different approach which is I am one with perfect health. I am one with perfect strength. I am one with perfect health. I am. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing. And I'm not trying to put myself on some pedestal here, but I believe we all have a choice. This is my choice, right? Yeah. I can choose which one I'm going to go to. And I'm choosing to go down this path that tells me I am one with perfect health, one with perfect wealth, one with perfect strength, peace, and all things. And this is where I'm going. Hey, I encourage everyone to go down this path. Why go down the other road? Like you said, what does that have to do with me? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you're right. Uh, it, it's about choices. It's about um, um, understanding who we are, who God made us to be, designed us to be, and embracing that. 
but don't embrace that with a, a, a with great effort, with a striving, with a stress yeah. involved yeah, in trying yeah. to be. You're, you're not that. Uh, right. you, you, who you are is who God's made you to be. And what you see in the mirror every day and the thoughts that accompany that, I want you to understand uh, that's not the end of who you are. Right. You, who you are is who you've always been as a spirit being. And we're coming back to the reality. Uh, Dr. K says that, uh, we we came into this human realm and we got amnesia. We forgot who <laughs> we were. Uh, yeah. but, but but that is even being restored. Um, and so I thank God. I mean, I'm so happy about this process. Sure. Uh, I told my guest last night, Pastor Kyle. I, I told him I said I I if I would have known this stuff when I was young, yeah. uh, if my parents had taught me this. But at the same time, I have to say that I'm really not upset about the journey. Uh, right. Yeah, there's some things I've got had to unlearn and some things I had to change, but I'm really not upset. I've enjoyed the journey. There have been some difficult times, some real difficult times, but I've enjoyed the journey. It's been a great uh, schoolmaster for me, not the law, but the process. It's been a great schooling and education that I can share with others or relate to others when they speak. I don't have to get all blown out of proportion because I've been there. I went right. through that. You know, I heard a preacher a few weeks ago. He said, the only hope that I have in this life is to pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he said that multiple times. I wanted to shout out to the guy. I wanted to shake his hand after church and say, you know what, dude, you are so wrong. You're so messed up with religion. But, you know, I just was courteous. And, um, and I, I just thank God that we're not where we used to be right. in our thinking. Sure. That we understand that Father God has brought us from a long way of thinking we were under the law and that the whole Bible applied to us. And yeah. we just didn't understand A to Z and had it all mixed up. And I'm so glad that Father God uh, has has been in us with us the whole time guiding us even when we didn't know we were being guided and brought us to this place that we can just chill and enjoy him. Where are we? Someone said we never left the garden. Yeah. Nothing changed. It, 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 whatever Adam did individually or representing all of mankind, I wasn't a part of that. <laughs> and I didn't know it, but I never left the garden. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I'll tell you what, Pastor Kyle, uh, every time we come to an end of a series, I um, I just wish we could go on. So we're just going to jump on to Tuesday night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and continue on and see what happens after that. But it's going to be a lot of fun with, with Michael Porter and Alec yeah. Martin and, uh, and us together. So uh, I just want to tell you how much I love you and appreciate you being on the show with me. Yeah, I love you too. Hey, Tuesday night, I, I, I so much appreciate Michael Porter and Alec Martin and yourself. I, I may be the quietest one on the panel because I just be soaking up all that goodness, man. <laughs> it, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. And, and thank you, everyone, for watching this morning. Thank you that you chose to spend your Friday morning, if it's morning where you are watching uh, for this last hour and 20 minutes um, as we've shared the word of God with you and shared our hearts. Um, if it's uh, if some other time of the day for you, thank you so much for taking the time to watch. We appreciate it so much. And we're going to see you next time. This is my last show for the week. We're going to see you on um, Tuesday, uh, unless we make some impromptu uh, uh, FaceTimes uh, between now and then. We'll see you Tuesday night with our panel discussion. And I'll be, we'll be announcing that and letting you know uh, what we're going to be talking about, but it don't really matter. It's just going to be a lot of fun. Whatever topic we choose, uh, we know that father is going to be talked about and, and uh, we're going to be telling you, who's your daddy? And you're going to know. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So we'll see you all. Uh, have a great weekend. Uh, if you are a church goer, go to church, rejoice, be, be, be happy. Let, let who the father is in you uh, be shared with other people as, as you love on them and, and interact. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. Uh, God bless you and uh, have a great day. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, guys. We love you.